question now is whether or not Mr. Gregory is entitled to appoint an attorney based on assets that the state indicates it has discovered. Yes, sir, Your Honor. And as Your Honor noted, I filed a motion on April the 1st of this year, Your Honor, 2014-A-46-1020438. I want the charges, Mr. Ronald Fred Gregory, with the charge of murder, asking the court to reconsider the indigency status. I became aware that the assets that Mr. Gregory, that the judge, Judge Malpas, relied upon in determining that he did qualify for appointed counsel were not fully represented to the court. There were additional assets that had not been made clear to the court, particularly under the section Your Honor noted just a moment ago, Section 6, do you own any real estate, stocks, bonds, notes, or other valuable property? And the only thing listed is a, I guess, what is his half interest, because the house is, the tax assessor values the house at $150,000, but he owned it jointly with his deceased wife. And so his half of it would be approximately $75,000 in some vehicles. But I became aware that he, in addition to this, he had some cash that he had withdrawn from a bank account that he had, and in addition to that, some cash that was available in a checking account. The cash he had withdrawn from a savings account totaled in the amount of approximately $40,000 in two separate withdrawals, $25,000 immediately prior to the crime, during the business hours of the day prior to the crime, and then $14,000 in the form of a certified check the day after. In addition to that, I became aware that he had a brokerage account with Merrill Lynch. Your Honor had asked me to sort of do a survey of his assets to properly inform the court of his net worth. I've done that to the best of our ability, and to that end, we have come to learn that he currently has $66,000 in family trust accounts, various family trust accounts, a $600,000 brokerage account with Merrill Lynch in the form of IRAs that are apparently titled solely in his name, and cash in a Wells Fargo checking account in the amount of $16,000. So that, in the form of liquid assets, there's approximately $685,000, which the state feels the court needs to be aware of in reconsidering and determining whether he is in fact in the general or whether he should retain counsel with his own means. The public defender does not represent him in regard to his financial situation, but for lack of a better way to approach it, because I've never had this before, I'll ask Mr. Dess what the public defender's office position is regarding the state's motion. Your Honor, first I'll put on the record that obviously I have been appointed to represent Mr. Gregory along with Mr. Barrico, so we're here to protect his criminal interest, the criminal court arena. This is what we're well versed in, and I want to inform the court that I have advised Mr. Gregory to invoke his Fifth Amendment right to remain silent, and he has indicated to me that he is going to do that throughout the course of this proceedings, and he will not be answering any questions. I didn't intend to ask you. Yes, sir. I just wanted to make that clear. That's one thing I wanted to get on the record from the get-go. The second thing, Your Honor, is, as you've indicated, I've never dealt with this situation before. I don't know what standing the state has now to come in to question the indigency status. I understand that this is a novel issue. I've been doing this for 24 years. I've never seen the state question someone's indigency status. Our position is, Judge, if you accept the facts as they are, obviously that we have to adhere to whatever the court advises us to do in terms of representation. But at this point, I am not well versed in Mr. Gregory's finances. I know that Mr. D'Agostino is here and Mr. Poore is here, the civil attorneys who have dealt with this issue. They're probably more well versed than I am to discuss that. But at this point, Your Honor, our position is that it's for the court to determine. It's not for us to present any evidence whatsoever regarding his indigency status at this point. And we do question the state's standing to move forward on this issue since in 24 years of practicing law, a particular case that has 
a murder case, there's a potential death penalty case that they now are coming into such a, a critical stage to try to to get us off the case. I, I, I don't I'm not trying to get you off the case. They're just trying to make sure that the public's money is protected. I believe the public defender's office would not be willing to represent somebody who is not innocent. And we, we do understand and, uh, I don't know, to, to your knowledge, has your office ever represented anybody that's got assets of over half a million dollars? No, sir. As it relates to joint accounts that Barbara Gregory had with Ronald Fred Gregory, um, and the, 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 under the South Carolina Probate Code 62-2-803, Ronald Fred Gregory is not entitled to any of those proceeds for any joint account, life insurance policy, jointly held personal property, any uh, <coughs> real estate held by a tenancy with survivorship under the statute, since he's since he and all we have to prove is by proponents of evidence has been charged, uh, as was argued to you last week. I don't, I'm not going to get into the guilt. I know he's not been found guilty, but we'll, we'll go ahead to the Iowa House and you listed several things. Did they own it as tenants in common? No, they sir. They, they do own it as a tenancy in common, and that is an asset he does own. It, half of it's now tied up in Barbara Gregory's estate, the other half is he does own that half interest. He owns a piece of property in Coney County, I believe. They provide you a copy of the deed. It might be worth $5,000. Um, he owns a half interest in that, so that'd be $2,500. The, the big account, the big asset that he does own an interest in, Your Honor, and so this office is correct, it's an IRA account, and that is an IRA at, uh, uh, it's, um, I don't know where it's, where it is. I'm Merrill right. Lynch. You've got the paperwork provided. Right. That is an IRA, and of course, that he does not have immediate access to that. That is also an account that is not subject to execution for judgments. So well, why doesn't he have access to it? He, well, he, he would go and he just has to possibly have a penalty. He would have to, it would take some time to withdraw the money. He would have penalties and income tax and things of that nature. Well, I, I find as a matter of law that someone who has uh, access to assets over half a million dollars, even if it's cut in half, uh, that's the uh, cost of representation is exceedingly skyrocketed, has uh, sufficient assets to pay for their own return. And the taxpayers uh, should not have to bear the expense of paying uh, for returning someone who has over a half a million dollars in assets, uh, regardless of whether they can be completely liquidated to that amount or to half that amount. So I want to uh, uh, find he is not indigent for purposes of appointment of the public defender and we will move forward with appointment, uh, not appointment because he's not entitled to appointment, but he will be pro se until such time as uh, he retains counsel. And, uh, I'll ask the solicitor to pay us over short order to that effect for me and run it by uh, Mr. Des, Mr. Gore, and Mr. Dagstino before I sign it. Um, Mr. Court, do you think it might be prudent to appoint a guardian ad litem since he is incarcerated to assist him uh, in communicating and contacting attorneys that might Well, he's got an attorney. Why don't we need a guardian ad litem? No, Mr. Gore, he's got yeah. an attorney. Correct. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you.